Senate Finance Committees would rely on categorical funding. And while we've advocated for full funding for high cost special ed, and we've advocated for full funding for uh, multi-language learners, uh, they've added a new one, they're gonna fully fund those and they added a new one. Categorical funding, and, and, and Senator De Palmer is very familiar with this, is not the preferable way to go. You wanna have all of these issues baked into the formula itself. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Senator Lou De Palmer from Middletown. A lot of you know him. If you're from Aquidneck Island, you certainly know him. Uh, he has a, a degree in computer science. He works at Raytheon. He has a master's degree uh, from Brown University in computer science. He's the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee and has been since 2008 uh, a, a state senator. Uh, and he also happens to be uh, the proud father of Kelly De Palma, who some of you remember served on the Middletown School Committee for a number of years. So without further ado, uh, Lou. Uh, so it, it's good to be here. I'm filling in for uh, Leader Pearson, Leader Ryan Pearson, who couldn't be here. So you got, maybe you got better than second best. You can decide later on. I think second best. Because uh, he's certainly a... Uh, expert in this. He's been looking at this for a long time, the education funding formula. We've worked on it together. We've worked on finance together for the years. But yes, as Tim said, uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me here. Hopefully this will be informative. Uh, I'm going to ask you some questions along the way because uh, I'm going to get tired of talking. I never get tired of talking. I can talk for about forever about nothing, but I want to have this somewhat interactive to hopefully you'll be engaged. And if you're going to fall asleep, I'll pick on you and ask you a question. So as Tim also mentioned, yes, Kelly De Palma, or Kelly Simeone, uh, she and I ran together when I ran for, I was on the school, uh, Middletown Town Council from 2004 to 2008. Uh, never had any intention to run it for Senate. I did. Ran in 2008. We campaigned together. And she served on the Middletown School Committee for uh, 12 years, her last four years as the uh, chair of the committee. And no, I didn't have her when I was 12. Uh, but she will be 38 in, uh, 38 in, uh, in September. Uh, so we've had had several conversations about the funding formula over the years. So I'm, I'm going to ask a general question I'm going to start off with. How many folks here were on a school committee, not continu maybe not continuous, doesn't make a difference, in 2008 or 2010? I figured some of you were, and certainly Dr. Flowers has been on there. So, uh, The formula we had before, and some of you might remember who, who've been on the committee, and certainly the folks from uh, Newport will remember, though he was the chair uh, in Middletown at the time, uh, was, may he rest in peace, Mike Crowley. Mike was chair of the, Middle, uh, the Middletown School Committee for a long, 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 long time. Great guy, great guy, he really was. And we had meetings uh, when I was on the council and then when I, uh, when I was on the, uh, got elected to the Senate, his words were, be careful what you ask for. What are the caseloads? Medicaid. We have 300, the last report I saw, and I get them every month, 362,350 folks on Medicaid in the state of Rhode Island. 362,000. Education comes close to the cost to the state to Medicaid, but it's... It, it's not there yet uh, from a cost perspective. Revenue is our income, right? So we're hearing, uh, and I've served on, so one of the pieces Tim mentioned, I do serve on the Senate Finance Committee. I'm chair this year of the Senate Finance Committee, and I serve on education. I've been on both of those for 15 years. I was chair of oversight uh, the last term. And last year and this year, we've never had economic times Put inflation aside for a second, because we need to address it. It is an issue, right? Costs have gone up. Anybody doing buildings out here know that cost of material, cost of labor have gone up. They're, gonna, they're coming down a little bit, but they're not going to come back to where they were. They're just not. They don't, no one should expect they will. Supply chains up and down. It's going to come to quiescent in state, but it's probably going to be sustained at here for a little while. Because once labor wages go up, not a person is going to say, oh, yeah, you can, cut my, you can cut my wages back to what they were before. Not going to happen. It's just a, a fact of that. So revenue, where we've heard that our revenue is going to be down a little bit from projection. Meaning, and what's the driver in that? The biggest driver in that is the income tax. 
with a less income tax than we thought uh, before. Our caseloads are also coming down, and it's coming down from projections we had in November. So when you hear all the numbers in the end, the state still has more money in a surplus than we had before. We, you, all, you folks all know surpluses don't get spent on operational, never get spent on operational, unless you have to for this short period of time, though you need to have a plan to recoup that later on because you, you're just digging yourself a big hole right away. It needs to go to one-time expenses. There's other issues about what we've done with the budget on how we've estimated to cause this surplus as opposed to having it part of the operational budget. And if we have extra money, yes, we should give it back, but the state's got a lot of needs in a bunch of areas. So we're in that phase right now of estimating caseloads, big expenses, and determining revenue. Why do I say that? All that factors into what I'm going to talk about here. So prior to 2012, I think, the formula was Governor, Governor how many folks remember Governor Kacheri, right? 28, 2008, 2009, uh, not 2009, 2010. I still remember sitting on the council and we get that one sheet and we're expecting what was the formula, as we said before? We didn't have one. 1% 1 across the board increase. May, may come, we're going to give you 2%. Bananas, everybody went out and celebrated because that's double what you, had, what you were expecting before. So now it's like you got a little lift in your step and you're going to go out dancing, right? Well, it didn't make a difference that you're, and Middletown was in this situation. Your number of students had gone down, continually had gone down over a long period of time, but you got more money. Mike Crowley, again, may he rest in peace, said, be careful what you ask for because we now have a funding formula. And as Tim said, what's the key driver in the funding formula? What's that? Students. Property, property values is a piece, but the multiplier is students. So if your property value goes up and down and your pre-K free and reduced lunch mod modulate themselves, it's multiplied by students. So if your property values from one year to the next stayed the same, let's say, uh, you hadn't done a statistical reval and all those kinds of things, medium income was about the same. Every year what changes? Students. We've seen that, I'll talk to some numbers in here in a minute. I know I'm getting you excited about the next chart, but I'm not gonna to go to the next chart yet. Uh, so you have to listen to me. Is the number of students drives a lot of the things that we're doing. So one of the things I ask you to think about, and uh, over the years I've done this when I was on the council, but even as well as the state, if we're gonna make an investment, some people say you're a tax and spend, call it what you want. We're gonna make an investment in education, or whatever, today, it needs to be something that's the right thing long term. Don't give me a nickel today and then tomorrow say, what do you, what's going to happen next year? I don't know. I had it today. I gave it to you today. You figure it out for next year. We have to look at things in a very systemic fashion. So one last piece before we get into this. I'm, I'm an engineer. That's why I came to Rhode Island. Next week, I was just telling the folks from Newport, I'll start the ninth month of my 40th year at Raytheon. Uh, Everything I do, I'm a chief engineer for our submarine system programs. It's facts, it's data. There's a context for that facts and data. And then there's the personal story. Because just facts and data and the context are critical. And the context is important. You can't just look at facts and data without the context. And we'll talk about that a little bit here. And then you have to have the personal story of, oh, by the way, we kicked off our project during the middle of the pandemic. The costs came back. Y, and our, our, we, we got X minus Y minus X. What do we do? That's the context. That's the personal story coming in. So we need to figure out how to address that. So I'm going to primarily talk about funding formula. I'm going to talk about some other foundational aid bills that are in there. And who's here from Warwick? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I think there's a resolution that you sent. Uh, thank you for that. There's a samples on the table. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, with regards to the foundational aid for housing, housing, we'll talk about that. And it's pretty straightforward. There might be a bunch of language in there. I could talk to you about why it's important. If we looked at one other piece, the East Bay. So I represent all of Middletown, all of Little Compton, Southern Tiverton, and the northeast corner of Newport. It is a gerrymandered district. Anybody thinks otherwise, you kid yourself. 
it is what it is. I don't really don't care because I enjoy it. I love the district. It is what it is. But I have to leave Middletown. I go to Portsmouth. I got to take a shower when I leave. No, I was kidding. I got, I'm, I got to go over the bridge. And I'm still not in the district, not till I get, not till I get down to Burger Marsh Road. So think about Burger Marsh Road, or really 24, Tiverton High School, 24, the east side of Fish Road, everything south. So that's what, uh, almost everybody in the East Bay is impacted by the foundational aid of housing aid of 35%. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, okay, I'll tell you what I think I see. I'm one senator of 38. There's 75 reps. We have a speaker, we have a Senate president, and we all get together to figure out where we go from here. So I'm gonna talk about things as proposed. Will they, what will they be in the end? Hopefully you folks will help us decide what you want and what you don't want, okay? So two key areas, funding formula and then legislative update. And the legislative update will talk about the housing aid, a couple of housing aid bills in there and a couple of bills on special education. Some of you might like, and some I'm sure you don't like. We'll talk about that as well. And I've sat through those hearings uh, over the last several years about it. I'll also say, now that he's back, uh, you couldn't have a better advocate than Tim uh, at the State House. Tim has his own chair or a piece of marble that he sits on if he doesn't have a chair to sit on, so he sits on the steps uh, there. We do have spirited conversations at times. We don't agree on everything. That's good, because if we agreed on everything, that's a problem. We need to have the back and forth and say, I see this, I don't see that. Uh, but I can see Tim being your voice. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. But it's not whether well, I like it or not, your voice is being heard, your voice is being represented. So, so let's talk a little bit about the funding formula as it stands today. I'm going to ask a basic question. I'm not going to get into a lot of the details. I can get into some of them. Uh, but I want to make certain folks have an appreciation for what we're talking about. How many have actually analyzed Somebody over here actually has, I think, have actually analyzed the components of the funding formula. Okay, so there's, there's a few folks that are looking at the, some of the details of it. And it's important, and forget about all the acronyms. So as an engineer and working in the defense industry, we have lots of acronyms, everybody does. There's acronyms in there, I try to spell them out in here, but that's what, so the first piece is the, uh, look at that. As we talked about before, and what's your first name? Mark, Mark had, Mark, you don't, you'd get a prize if I had some, but you don't get a prize, so I don't have any to give you. Uh, maybe you can have another uh, bagel later if you want. Take a bagel home for with you. It's all driven by the resident average daily membership. Students in seats. Students in seats. Right? There's a context to that as well. So in education several years ago, uh, Superintendent Germain from Newport came and spoke to us about Numbers of students they have in start of school, number of students in October. Do you think the number was the same? No. So we talked about the number of students that were English, English language learners. Do you think that was the same in September and it was in October? No. But you had to ask that context question. Because if you just heard the net change, you would have heard this, only to find out that some came and went, like in some other communities, and talking to a uh, maybe she's going to be a congressman at some point, or a congresswoman, or a senator. Why is that the case? Why did the number change? Why does L go up? Well, some of the transient population, and it's primarily boys, males, they want the male to be able to learn English. They turn 17, and they're going to work for the family. That's the context. It's important to know. We hope they will want to graduate Families do fam what families are going to do. We, gotta, we want to try and help encourage them to get their high school diploma, but at the end of the day, their family has other priorities that we need to seek to address. So that's the, that's the part of the context, but everything driven by the average daily attendance. Then we apply the core instruction dollar amount for each student, and it's gone up over the years uh, since then, since this first got put in place in 2012. I want you to, later on, we're going to talk about this. The next piece, we, the, the, who's heard about the student success factor? Okay. What this means, so we have the core amount, so we have 1,000 students, and we say the core deal amount for each student is $10,000. 1,000 times 10,000, that's your number, base number, what it is to educate the students. 
Then we say, well, there's a student success factor. And that's pretty much based on and determined by those students that are free and reduced lunch. That's how it's determined. I'm going to make a very general form here. The number's higher than this. We say that's 40% of the uh, base number of the core instruction. So that would be $4,000. So I have, if I have 100 English language learner students, I multiply 100. There again, it all goes back to numbers. It's factors. I love equations. You can write these equations down. 100 times 4,000, you add that to the 1,000 times the, uh, the, the 4,000 or whatever, the 10,000 number I said before. Those are the key, some of the key numbers. So it applies to this, those less than or equal to the 185% of the federal poverty level. And there's a way that the states use to try and determine the, uh, those who are considered free to reduce lunch to get reported. Uh, and I'm not certain that we have, we've, we've had a standard way of doing it. And, we'll, and we continue to look to change it, because are we missing some students? Are the right students in there? It's important to make certain the number's right, whatever the number is, up or down. It's important to make certain the number's right and everybody's counted. And then there's the categoricals. So I'll talk about categoricals here in a minute. So we had uh, English language learner as a categorical. But the student success factor was about free and reduced lunch. Notice I didn't say English language learners, right? I said free and reduced lunch. If you're in a poverty situation, free and reduced lunch as an equation. I'm speaking, I'm going to speak very directly. I'm not going to speak with regards to pointing one group or another, but if you're free and reduced lunch, it basically said English language learners are separate. Well, might not be the case. Right? There might be more. You might be an English language learner and not be free and reduced lunch. We've seen some of that. So that's, think about that because that's going to inform what you're going to see, inform what you're going to see in a couple charts from now. There's other categoricals uh, such as transportation, other things that are in. What's another categorical that you, all you folks worry about every single day? High cost, special ed. It's a big cost. I'm not going to continue to talk about me, but I'm going to talk about personalizing it. When I sat on the council in between 2004 and 2008, and the number of students had gone down, but the school budget went up by a million dollars. At its context, it doesn't make sense. How is that the case? So you got to go look and you tease out. It's like, what are the high nails? Do a Pareto analysis on where, where did those costs go from one year to the next? And what was the highest increase in cost from one year to the next? Special ed, out of district tuition. All the special ed stuff is a part of that. That sought to bring the funding for high cost special ed down to one or two, two times. Right now it's five times. So what does that mean? It's like 80 something thousand dollars. That's a high, that's a big number. Some students deserve every penny of that. But if you don't get to that number, sorry. You think you, you're paying for that. It's a big driver in your budget, so there's, some, there's, a big, there's an effort uh, to seek to see how to address that. But the, the thing about the English language learners that uh, I was a supporter of, excuse me, as a categorical, that I was a supporter of, when we bake everything into the pot, the soup tastes like whatever the soup's going to be. If I have some stuff on the side because I don't like uh, uh, escarole, she got all of them, my grandmother used to say, right? I put it on the side. I, taste, I put it in my soup, but my daughter doesn't like it. I can measure what that is. My firm believer on the English language learner piece was, and I used to say this to the superintendents, and there were many of them over the years, uh, with regards to that, are we getting the return on the investment? You all folks are spending a lot of money on this. Are we getting a return on the investment? I'm always going to ask a respectfully direct question. Do we expect people to graduate, I'll say, through and out of being an English language learner? They said, yes. Okay. How much time is that? Three years. Okay. I, didn't get, no, I don't know what the answer was. I, didn't, I wasn't going to prescribe one way or the other, but they said yes. So as a categorical, there might be a way to see uh, if we were getting a return on that investment. Because it's all of our tax dollars that are going to that, and it's a lot of state money. 
By the way, you folks are in charge of the most money in the state of Rhode Island, cities and towns, categorically. 60-70% of cities and towns budgets on average are education, right? A lot on your shoulders. We thank you for that, absolutely. It's a big, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Anybody here from Providence? So I say to folks, I represent District 12, Middletown, Little Compton, Tiverton, and Newport. As Providence goes, so goes the entire state, categorically. There were 24,000 students. There aren't any more. 24,000 students in the city of Providence. It's a big deal. So when people talk about we're going to raise the state, we'll get it to a certain point, everybody else can. If Providence doesn't get there, we're not getting there. It's good. I, and I say that respectfully, and I, I chaired the oversight uh, committee in that. We had several hearings on Providence Public School Department and what's happening there because the state took it over, et cetera. But it's, it's a big investment being made by Providence, but all of you are responsible for big investments in the state. So the English language learner thing, and I've come to see how it can be measured differently via UCOA, which took a long time to be implemented, but there's a lot of facts and data in there, but you've got to look at the context, uniform chart of accounts for education. So then we get down to the resultant share municipality, as you said earlier, community's wealth, ability to pay, housing, all those kinds of things. What are the, what's the property taxes like? Tangible property. By the way, we're looking to address tangible property uh, this year. All that drives the equation. Formula 50 available dollars and allocation. Anybody here from Brown University? I was going to ask. So I knew Dr. Wong. Uh, in fact, Dr. My, my daughter, uh, I think when I was on the council, because she's, yeah, because she graduated from, I didn't think about that. Was she in college? Of course she was, because uh, she didn't run until, she ran when she got out of college in 2008. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Wong from Brown was involved, and he, you'll see him around. I think he's going to be on a, a panel coming up at something else later this month in developing the funding formula from Brown University. She was in his class at the time. What can, what, can you what can somebody tell me about the funding formula uh, that was created in general? What, what, were your thought, what were your thoughts? Just give me, I'm going to ask three thoughts. It was made to level the playing field for all the students. Okay, made to level the playing field for all the students. No one could understand it. No one could understand it. <laughs> 50 available dollars. So as an engineer, uh, folks in here have taken numerical analysis or calc not so much calculus, numerical analysis in college. You give me some numbers? Yes? No. Oh, I'll say it. You, uh, okay, uh, I was going to ask you another, another, I was going to ask you a numerical analysis question, no, just kidding. The, uh, you give me a set of numbers, I'll give you the equation for it. it it's existed for a long time. And I asked Commissioner Gist at the time, I know exactly where I was, and Dr. Wong was there, and then we've asked it several times. And finally, uh, but the answer was, we don't create an equation that comes out with the money we got right now, and it all works, without fitting the equation to the money, which is what we did, what the state did. And then build it up over years, so the losers, and there were losers, people said, no, those people got less. They were a loser. You lost over 10 years, and you gained over seven, right? Well, it fit the available dollars. Economically and practically, sort of had to do that. But don't lie to folks. Don't tell folks something that it's not. We fit the available dollars. Was that the right policy? At the time it was, from the perspective of that's the money, but from a policy perspective, no. We needed to do. But the formula we had before was we didn't have one. So that's sort of the, the backdrop of where we are from a, okay. This page uh, I borrowed from the governor's briefing. Uh, it, it did say in the bottom, it was embargo to 4 o'clock, so I had to cut a picture out of it. This was, it was embargo to 4 o'clock back in January, so it's not embargoed anymore. This is what the governor currently has in the proposed budget. These five areas, and it includes upwards of about $58 million increase. There's a but there. We'll go back to that in a minute. So based on what he proposed, that's, that's what's there. So the student success factor that I talked about earlier, that looked at free and reduced lunch, the governor's saying, let's move that from 40% to 42%. So I'm going to ask folks a minute later, uh, 
Tell me why it's 2% increase. I'm going to pick on somebody if you don't give me an answer. Okay? The next, the uh, Public Schools Choice Supplemental Transition Fund. Fancy name for compensate traditional school districts for money that went to charter schools. So I say to folks, I support all education. Public, traditional public, public charter, mayor academies, non-traditional uh, charters, uh, private, homeschool. We have it all. It's not going away. We need to ensure all of our students, wherever they go to school, however they go to school, they get the best education they can. Because at the end of the day, we all depend on that. Right? So we have to figure out, with all that, in that equation that we have, how do we ensure we're not uh, strangleholding and starving one over here while one over here is growing or doing whatever? So it's a balancing act. Categorical funding. Multilingual learner piece, the categorical, right? And then the special ed category fully funding the, by $4.8 million, increasing it. That's the high cost. That's the five times. Because right now we don't do it all. We do a piece of it. So whatever we got, we spread it out, a portional, here you go, thank you, and uh, it is what it is. So the other two, uh, two uh, students experiencing homelessness and the temporary enrollment transition support. So over the last two years, what's been the impact to cities and towns on the less loss of students in your district? Trick question. Who said that? Sorry, oh, yeah, you could. Some, okay. Hold harmless. There was no impact. We did it twice because of the pandemic. Okay, you know what? Whatever you got before, we're not going to touch that. The students you had number was going to stay the same. Do we? Who thinks we have less students in our public schools today than we had, or in general? than we had pre-pandemic. You're all right. So going back to, what was your first name again, Mark? Mark. Okay, I was going to ask you again, but I remember now, Mark. Uh, Mark's comment before about how, how's the equation determined? First number, numbers of students. Numbers of students go down, your number goes down. It's, it's math. Yes. Okay, so um, yes, I totally agree with that. Um, I'm Emily Copeland from Portsmouth. Uh, April 18th, we did a deep dive into the state aid funding formula as it goes to Portsmouth. Because um, as Senator De Palma mentioned, you know, all the East Bay communities really got racked this year with um, cuts from state aid. And I will make the link available to Tim, who can share it to everybody else. But the numbers of students affected, but the key driver are the property values. Because we did, we had um, a really good detailed presentation with an Excel spreadsheet that added 40 students <coughs> to our district, and we got like $50,000. It changed the property value, and that was the huge driver. So while I agree with that, I think it's an oversimplification to point to everything with the students going down. Our students have dropped 10%, and our, I have a lot of voice. Well, <laughs> recording it. Oh, OK, time. sorry. I would just say the numbers show that our student population dropped 10%. Our state aid dropped 40%. So I would, I would encourage you all to check that out, especially if you have seen these incredible property value increases. You're, you're spot on. What I was. The, uh, I'm not making, uh, you know, I'll get to a point in a minute with regards to, I think there's a question here, Tim. With regard, yeah. Just very quickly, Senator, um, I'm from Lincoln, mm -hmm. student population. Right. Um, on the other hand, our property values increased over the last time. And so we're actually getting less money Correct. this year than get, in the past. So it is that nuttiness I'm, I'm gonna, in I'm, them. I'm going to get to that, but at the end of the day, if those other things are kept equal, dropping the number of students across the state affects that. But you're spot on. Property value we're going to get to next. Prior to the establishment of a funding formula, there had been uh, a change in, I think it was uh, 3050, Correct. which was designed to hold, um, to keep pr local property taxes from increasing. So it capped them. Yes. And so the battle over funding for p our public schools happens at the state house. Yes. And at the local level, and it's, it, it's ongoing. Correct. Senate Bill 3050, which was, that's what the bill, back in 2005 or 2006, Tim, Senate President Teresa Piva-Weed, that was her bill. I remember going to CCRI and listening to it, 
but you're right. And it ultimately got it down to the 4% cap, and you can exceed it, but you had to have extenuating circumstances, and nobody wants to exceed it and all that. So let's go to the next piece. So this is what the governor proposed. We wanted to make certain, as I said earlier, whatever short-term decisions we're going to make have a long-term lasting impact in the right direction. Right? So focus on making sustainable enhancements and updating the formulaic policies. I like that word formulaic. It's uh, formulaic, four syllables. Every once in a while I get to use a four syllable word. That's one of them. What does that mean? The formula we're going to use, we're going to want to ensure incorporates the right policies we want in the, fun, in the, in the, in the funding formula. Not just, and you can hear one in a second, a categorical that will attach an appendage over here. I have two legs and two arms. You know, if I had a third, third arm, I'd be able to let's stick another arm over here so I can use it when I need a third arm. Now, how do I make my arms that I have be able to do, or if I'm doing some work, I could do it with the two arms that I have. The arms of the formula, let's talk to that. So some of the facts from 2019 to 2022. So every March, so we're going through it now, I didn't want to include the latest numbers here because I'm a firm believer in trust but verify. We have the March numbers, it's almost the end of April, but we're still trying to plow through the numbers in the Senate Fiscal Office on what the numbers look like. So back, in the, so in the formula, we want to account for the decline in statewide loss of about 4,600 students, about a 3.3 percent loss. Among traditional districts, traditional public, 6,500 students. Changes in the poverty level measure weren't fully vetted with regards to uh, what the governor. So I'm going to go back to the question, real quick, before we go to the next chart. Raising the student success factor, which is built off of poverty, what's the impact of, why go to 2%? And uh, somebody down here, why go to 2%? I'll add in when they, they went with the success factor based on free and reduced lunch, it was a proxy also for um, ELL and a proxy for special ed because they trended in the same way. That's not the case now. There's been an increase in language learners, and that's what's causing some issues. Tim, thank you for leading me to my next chart, which is phenomenal. After that. Nobody knows. It's part of the $58 million. So at the end of the day, I suspect, uh, you chair now, Emily? Yeah. Okay. I suspect uh, Chair Copeland, when the, she got the budget, the first thing she did, first thing I did, was go look at my four cities and towns, Middletown, Little Compton, Tiverton, and Newport. And we all lose. In fact, Middletown, I mean, Little Compton, doesn't get much money from the state, they get even less. We get even less. Anybody here from Little Compton? No. Okay. But from a Portsmouth perspective, uh, <coughs> the thing you care about, how much is coming to Portsmouth? Cumberland, how much is coming to Cumberland? Providence, how much is Providence getting? You looked at it, bottom line, you don't really care about the details along the way. Is it in parentheses or not? Parentheses is negative, not parentheses. Go and celebrate. Parentheses, what do we do? Call up your state rep and senator and say, what are you doing on that formula now? Right? How are you going to help us? No one could come to find the rationale for doing that. That's not a formula. That's like saying, put another equation at the end because we need to make something up. Anybody here from Central Falls? Okay. With regards to the formula, I'll move on. The one when they got presented to us about uh, that from a Central Falls perspective was, we looked at all that. This is Ride. Look, great. Is Mario here yet? By the way, Mario's going to be here later. Mario's the real deal. You want to know anything about housing aid? You talk to Mario. Real deal. Tells you like it is. Not going to give you the uh, inside story or the outside story. He tells you like it is. With regards to Central Falls, when they put the form formula together, it's like, yeah, it doesn't work for Central Falls. What do we do? Oh, let's go justice over here. Up oh, works now. Okay. That's an equation. But it's a short-term equation. Because what happens next year, Emily? Chair? You, do, you, you adjust it again, right? OK. Uh, so what are the key drivers in the Senate proposed funding formula? So Senator Leader Pearson, uh, I'm, I'm a sponsor of it. Uh, we've heard this bill. We're going to be working to modify it. So as, let me also say, 
Don't run home and say, this, we're, we're doing this. Proposal, just like the governor's budget. It's a proposal. Everything in the budget is a proposal. Why is it a proposal? Until the public comes and says, we like it, we don't like it, do this or do that, it's a proposal. It needs to be reviewed and vetted. Right? So what does the, the, the Senate proposal do, which I'm excited about? We move the non-free and reduced lunch ELL students into the student success factor. Right? Take that appendage away that has the L down here, that little hand over here somewhere, and we say it's part of the student success factor. Because guess what? That's what it critically is. That's what it critically is. When you do that, because why? Under the current formula, L students provided, and this could be uh, about $1,100 of support in the categorical for L students. Student success factor at one point was $4,400. Well, if English language is a barrier to me being educated and costs more, if I had it as a categorical at $1,100 and not at the student success factor of $4,000, we're shortchanging you from you being able to educate children that are English language learners. That's a formulaic foundational piece that's proposed to be part of the formula, not that categorical over here. Why is that the case? That's what the numbers show. How do you think we know that that's what the numbers show? Anybody? Give me three guesses. How do we, how, Get not, the data from Ryan. what's that? Get the data from Ryan. Partially, you're, you're going on the right path. Keep, keep pulling that thread of going down, getting data from Ryan. Context. Context, yes, but one more. Somebody. Stabilization fund. See? Stabilization fund. Stabilization fund. We looked at the UCOA data. Right? We got this phenomenal, so my uh, facts and data are a phenomenal repository of wealth, categorically. My undergraduate degree, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this briefly. My undergraduate degree is in computer engineering, primarily on the software side. My graduate degree is in computer science focusing on artificial intelligence. The learning of that UCOA data, there's data that exists. My concern, uh, so I tell my wife, I'm gonna be around 43 more years. My grandmother lived to one month shy of her 103rd birthday, all at home. Went upstairs at night, went downstairs in the morning, sometimes sitting down or on her knees, one month. So I, got, I just turned 62, I got 43 years left to go. 30, 40 years from now, 200 years when we're not here, where do I have it? I put it away. All these thumb drives that we got, all these CDs that we have, all, these, all this stuff, the stuff that's in the cloud, the stuff that has been collected by folks that shouldn't have collected some of it, is going to be a treasure trove of wealth of information. Why? Can you go do an analysis on that and do either induction, learning, meaning generalize something from the details, or take the, de the general and do deduction to get some specific things out of it. I'd love to be around 200 years from now, absolutely. I'd love to come back and say, look at that UCOA data Rhode Island had. They didn't know that, but if they had done that in, in 2023, Chair Copeland from Portsmouth would have been happy. But we didn't do it, because we didn't know about it. So the UCOA data, the Uniform Chart of Accounts, guided us towards that. Let's use our facts. Let's use our data to inform the conversation. If we can't agree on the facts and the data, let's stop the conversation, right? You can't, we can't have our own set of facts and data. But what we can have, as was said before by uh, Cook Committee Winslow, context. That's the important part that we have to make certain we know about. As the chair from Portsmouth said, with regards to students went up, and our property value went up, and we get less money. How's that? How can that happen, right? That's the context we have to look at. So these are some more parts of the, these are the, as I said, key driver. There's other things there. Don't just, this isn't just it, but if we wanted to spend three hours on this, we can go through every part of the quadratic mean equation. So I am going to talk about numbers in a minute. Before I get there, and I think it's the, yeah, next chart. Okay. We all remember 
I don't know what grade it was, early math, where we did exponents, squares, right? We, um, the square of two, two squared is how much? Four. Very good. Everybody have another, uh, have another piece of fruit. You get another piece of fruit for that. Five squared is 25, okay? So two squared was four, right? Five squared is 25, okay? <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, if I look at uh, two and five, and I look at, I mean, if I look at two and five, then I look at their squares, four and 25, it's a big difference. What happens when I square a number compared to another number? Say it again. By the way, I have big ears, so I can hear a lot, but I can't hear that. It's exponential increase because we're talking about exponents greater than one. Right? If it's an exponent less than one, it goes the other way. In our quadratic mean equation, we have exponents. What does that do? It magnifies things. Sometimes it magnifies the wrong thing to as what you folks are seeing. That's what we're seeking to address as well. So if one number was 2 and you squared it, it was 4, and the other number was 5 and you squared it, it was 25, it's, what's the emphasis going to be on? The 25. As opposed to it might need to be on the 2, but the equation is the equation. We follow the equation, right? That's what we're following. So what are we looking at? The, re the real issue with the formula and its impact to the LEAs, it's not the foundational amount. It's the state share ratio for the communities, going back to what the chair said earlier. And how is that determined, Chair? And? Uh, well, median income. So property value, median income, determines the city's wealth, right, or a town's wealth. Then, then there's the multi But this is the ratio. This is applied to what? What's this applied to? Students as a multiplier, right? I know you probably didn't plan to ask, being asked questions and doing a little homework on Saturday morning, but uh, you, you're stuck with me, not Senator Pearson, not Leader Pearson from Cumberland. So, uh, so the shear ratio, as we talked about it earlier, it's the quadratic mean. They said it was a root mean squared. No, it's a quadratic mean that we're looking at. What does it mean? An average. Right? Two numbers divided by two, you get an average. Uh, so the shear rate it tended to provide more weight to the factor indicating a greater need for state support. However, in some of the poorest districts where there more than 50% of their pre-K students live in poverty, the quadratic mean has an adverse impact. Anybody here from Woonsocket? You folks are impacted. Anybody here from Pawtucket? You're impacted. We already know Providence is here. You're impacted. Central Falls, probably the four, the four communities that are severely impacted by the formula. Well, all, some, but the formula was, put in, was modulated some when it was first put in place uh, as a result of the Newport. And why would you say Newport? Why would, be, why would Newport be impacted by, impacted in the formula? Okay, answer high, high number of students with free and reduced lunch. What's another factor that takes it the other way? Property values, where nobody lives. Right, property values. A lot of property, a lot of value. Well, it's, there again, context. So in fact, and looking at it back then, the formula was modulated to try and address those kinds of things in some cities and towns. Not the case in Providence. Not the case in Woonsocket. Not the case in Pawtucket, right? So we, we, we gotta, when we do the equations, we've got to look at all 39 cities and towns, 36 LEAs. We look at the Met. We look at Davies. We look at the charter schools. Where, where does all that fly? That's a part of the thing, okay? So what's the ratio? What are we doing? If, poverty, if, if the poverty density in a district is greater than 50% and the state share ratio, the SSRC, is greater than the quadratic mean, then the state share should be based on the SSRC. Well, I'm going to leave that there. It's a lot of details. We could take a couple hours to go through some of those. But those are some, these are some of the things that we're making 
conditional on. Are we excited about that? Not necessarily because this is looking, going back to uh, committee woman in the back, you said, what was that word before again? The C word? No, context. context, right? Context, it's important. So that's one of the factors being amongst other being looked at. So I'm in, I'm in West Oak. So we have all the shoreline communities, mm -hmm. right, that have uh, very high property values, but none of those people have kids in school. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another, I mean, certainly we're not Newport. We don't have the properties they do. But if you, if you look all along the you shoreline. You have Taylor Swift, though. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's one. But um, so that's what we saw, especially, I mean, it's been increasing over the last 20 years. But the neighborhood I live in mm -hmm. now is more than half people who, you know, live in New York, Connecticut, New Hampshire most of the year, don't have kids in our schools. Um, but the property values are going way up. The students are going way down. So that's we're being fought both ways. Correct. That, and that increasingly happened during the pandemic when people came out of the cities and stayed, you know, in our community yeah. all, you know, two years or whatever. But again, uh, high property value, no kids in the school system. It's a uh, it's a factor. Absolutely. Some would say, uh, right, because I, some would say no kids in the school system, that's a good thing, because it's not affecting your costs. Well, it's a multiplier on what you get, so it, it, comes, it comes around. Clearly, what's manifested itself with property values in Westerly's seen it, Middletown has seen it in spades, Newport's seen it in spades, Tiverton is, little con anybody along the shore, Narragansett, short-term rentals, South Kingstown, Charlestown, Jamestown. Black Island, there we go, okay. Short-term rentals, short-term rentals. It is amazing. It, Rhode Island, uh, I'm not gonna sing the Rhode Island song, no. no. I don't want the house, I want the foundation. I'm gonna level the house. I'm gonna put up as high as I can. I'm gonna come there a few weeks of the year. I'm gonna rent it the rest of the time. And the property value there went up three or four times of what the value was before. What does it do to the next door neighbor? That property value goes up as well. So it, those are other factors that the context. Yes? I just want to bring up being from Newport also. One of the things that I never see really in the funding formula is low income housing, which there is a law to get to 10%. Since that law has been put in place, there's been no change. Correct. And Newport has both the high cost and the low cost. And so that's never in the state been calculated into any formula I've ever seen, and it's a critical component mm -hmm. that 10% rule has had no effect. I'd love to hear if that's ever gonna be included, because it has a huge impact on schools. Huge, huge, huge. So the, I'll always answer the question respectfully directly. Uh, there's four words I never use unless I'm talking about, unless I, you should never use unless you're talking about your spouse, significant other, whatever. My wife and I will be married uh, 40 years in December, I haven't argued with her once. I'm not going to argue with you. I don't have to win any argument. It's not going to happen. You can be right all the time. That's OK. But the case about all, none, never, and forever, I don't know. It's been discussed. I think Senator Picard, I think, has had a bill in that looked, or some other people have had bills in that looked at, if you're greater than 10%, you should get more for education aid or other things. Other people had put the stick. If you're less than 10%, we're going to hit you across the head, and we're going to take some money away for uh, educate, not special ed, uh, education, but take some money away from education. We're not there yet. I don't think, I don't see it on the immediate horizon. Not to say that it can't be, it can't be there, but it is an impact. And fully fund the high cost special ed. I think we need to do more than just, this is just me speaking, yet. other people have done to sell, fund more than just the high cost, more than just five times. Should it be less, should it be four times? Three times. If it's over three times, we take the balance. My take on it, special ed. We'll talk about a couple of special ed bills. We, the state, should cover all of the special ed. Everything over one time. And I'll, <coughs> Sorry. And I, I, I'll get to it in a minute. Hang on a second. Because at the end of the day, that's what drives your budgets significantly. And get, but you know what? And it should. 
because those students need every single support that they require. At the end of the day, if whatever services they need to lead a full and productive life, they need those services. I want to talk about a couple bills at the end on that. But Let's go to your question. Oh, you left. Okay, question's been answered. Oh, we answered your question. Oh. What's your first name? What's Mike. your first name? Mike. Mike. I just answered your question, Mike. I'll, I'll see you later. I'll tell you what I answered. No. <laughs> so address, address the local share. It, you notice there's no specifics there. If there was, I put it up there what the proposal is. I think initially we need to start having it reported and documented and being transparent. You're spot on, it was Mike you said? Right, so you're saying being starved, being starved from? The city, right? Yeah, I, that's what I figured you were gonna say. That's occurred in many cities and towns across the state of Rhode Island, many cities and towns. What's transpired, as the state share is going up, what happened to the local share? It went up, right? No, no, it went down. It's. This is where we have to look at 39 cities and towns. We have to look at, we're not coming down with the hammer. Before you do anything, you need to have facts and data about it. So the, the first step in doing something is having the facts and data about it, having it reported, have it out there, so everybody in all your communities can see it, right? I'm sure everybody here in the school committee, I know it from hearing it from my daughter when I was in, uh, in the Senate, not just, uh, Hey, you. Hey, Dad, what are you going to do about helping us with regards to uh, the money we're not getting from the town? I wish you luck, honey. Thank you. No. It's, we, get, we need to figure out how to help move that ball forward. Was it a show in Cumberland? In spades. In spades. In spades. It's better. It is. Because Senator Pearson and I, we shared our office together. We'd have a challenge about the conversation. We go through the whole conversation in the hearing, and I see him later, I was like, I call him, Ryan, hey, Ryan, the issue in Cumberland is the city's not giving you the money they need. They're not giving it to them. So it's the case where, and going back to that 4% number, if you don't, artificially, if you, we all want to keep taxes low, absolutely. Taxes should be whatever they need to fund the critical services in your city and town. There's some basic stuff, right? I think the most important one is education. And if that's not being there, because, oh, you're getting more from Mar uh, Aunt Mary? Well, go, Joe, I'm not giving I'm going to give you. Mom and Dad say, you got it over there. I don't have to give it to you. We need to, we, there's no answer to address it yet. Mike, we're going to look at, if, if we move forward with this, how do we at least capture what's happening there uh, to then be able to say, okay, based on all this, let the facts and data and the context speak for itself. So the facts and data and the context we had, and when Cumberland came, they talked to us in spades about it. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah, but this, the town's not giving you the money. You're right. Okay, it's, that's, that's what's, what's trying to stem the tide. So we're trying to figure out what can we do at the state level when the town's not get, town or city's not giving the money that they, I'll just say, they should be. Somebody say, we can't, we don't have it. Education's critical, we gotta figure it out. Uh, so, at the end of the day, going back to, and I'm going to pick on uh, Chair Copeland again, all she cares about is how much money, respectfully, at the end of the day, is Portsmouth in parentheses or not? Is it high parentheses or low parentheses? <laughs> we, we care about whether we're in parentheses, but I think, I, I mean, I have to say, I think, Portsmouth is one of the wealthier towns in Rhode Island, and it recognizes that cities and towns that are, have higher poverty need more. But what is so screwed up about the, the funding formula, I think everybody would agree, is the predictability and the transparency. We went through 10 years of decreases, and we thought, okay, after 10 years, it'll level out, we'll know where we stand. And every year since then, it's been a decrease. Right. So I feel like, you know, cities and towns are supposed to have maintenance of effort. I feel like the state also needs a minimum 
maintenance of effort. You know, start with something easily clear, transparable, tran transparent, so that our finance directors can say we have X students, we should get a minimum of X, and then add on all these extra things, ELL, poverty, whatever the state wants from a policy perspective, mm -hmm. as opposed to we keep going back to the funding formula, and your point from the beginning was it's not anything we should put on a pedestal and, and idolize because it was just built to fit a certain amount of a budget. So it's not really necessarily addressing it. So, so the, at the end of the day, I, I, I care not just about the negative, but I, I care about our predictability because it's these swings and last year at the end of the day, they just gave us 122,000. It's like the town took it. I mean. We didn't ask, we didn't know it was coming. Right. This year, it was a projected 17% decrease, 562,000, right. and the governor says, well, one time offset, so now we're only losing 252. Who knows, yeah, who knows what it's gonna be next year? And, and I feel for our town council, you know, it's just, okay. you're, and, you're, and I, wish the, I wish Ryask would have talked about that when you were up at the state making all the comments on the bills, because it, felt like it wasn't really addressing a lot of what some of the districts were facing. Well, no, we, it, was, it, it, it was hurt. Just yep. the, you know, we, we have weighed in on the form students in the funding formula. Um, the state elected not to do that. Ken Wong, who was at Brown University and now at the Annenberg Institute, worked with the department and they used free and reduced price lunch as the proxy for all of that. But relative to predictability, Part of the problem is going to be if your, your student population goes up or down, it's going to affect how much. Okay, but it doesn't go up and down that much. It, it also is impacted by the number of students that are qualified for the student success factor. So if you have a decrease in poverty, you're losing that 40%. The other parts of the formula they think that, that Senator De Palmer talked about that are problemsome are, are special ed. You have to begin incurring special ed costs in excess of $75,000 before you get any reimbursement. And they've frozen that because it's a categorical fund at $4.5 million for the last six or seven years. Correct. The governor has, has increased it to 100%, but that was an exercise in trying to fit into a number. They backed into what they got. That what, what, what's going on now with regard to the governor's proposal is it's actually more this equalizing to the formula than what the Senate is proposing. It's not perfect, but it's never, the problem with predictability or all of the factors that go in to making that determination can change on an annual basis. Not the least of which is the amount of money that the state puts in and what the locals put in. I think uh, Senator De Palma was part of the committee that looked at the task force, that looked at Correct. the funding formula, determined three communities were not even me meeting the core foundation amount. Providence, Pawtucket, and uh, Woonsocket, Woonsocket, we're not even appropriating the, the correct amount because maintenance of effort uh, served as a floor. I'm, I'm taking your time. That's good. But, let me, uh, but you know, we, we have advocated for, for formula changes. The problem is, is that, that we also have to balance how much money urbans get as opposed to suburbans. When the formula was originally proposed, there was a decision to combine free and reduced price lunch. There were advocates in the urban core that said, no, it should be free lunch as a weight and a lesser weight for reduced. That would have driven almost all of the state dollars to about five or six communities. And you would be at the mercy of, of property taxes going forward. So I think we have a question here. I'll come back. Yes, sir. You can't exceed the 4% cap. Meanwhile, the town has its own increased expenses, particularly this year with the inflationary factor. And it's a huge, it's a huge problem. We can't, we can't adjust fast enough and a drop in enrollment of, say, 10 or more students doesn't mean we eliminate a class to adjust because, you know, because we've got required union requirements of a minimum class size and so forth. So I just wanted to throw that no, in. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Those are all the factors. By the way, that's the, con the co piece about context again, the inflationary costs in there. So we need to figure out, we don't have a perfect formula. What I'll say, the formula now is getting to its... Uh, trying to get into its adolescent phase. We were in its infancy phase for 10 or 12. We were. We were. We, we were in our, in our infancy phase for 10 to 12 years. We're now getting to the adolescence phase to say what worked, what didn't work, 
how are we actually using the uh, UCOA data? I'd have to check on how the homeschool students are included. I don't know. Okay, I'll check. I didn't think they were, but I, I'm never going to give you an answer without facts and data. So I, if, if they're not, then the answer is they're not. But I want to make certain that they're not. The, uh, no, but I was saying before about the context of the, uh, uh, the pandemic, what happens there. This is going to, be an, this is going to continue to evolve. Right? It just is. We need to figure out for different situations. By the way, Senator Ujafusa, phenomenal supporter from the Portsmouth perspective. We've had conversations. She, I don't know if she came to the hearing or not. We've talked about it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure she's seen. We're going to have a meeting with some folks to, in the Senate to go a little more detail. Like I said, we had the hearing on this. More conversation has to happen. On, and as, please don't walk away and say, it's going to be better. We believe it's going to be better. We're going to make it better. Just know that these are some proposals. Uh, and the House needs to, need to hear this as well and have conversation with the House. I can assure you, I can assure you this, I only will guarantee things that I can do. I never guarantee anything that I don't have control over. I don't have control over much. Uh, when we have discussions with the House on the budget, this will be discussed. Why? Because I'm part of those discussions with the House on the budget. And those have begun. So we will have this as part of that discussion. Yes. Michelle Brousseau, South Kingstown. What's the chances that as this formula evolves, transportation will ever become part of the funding formula? <laughs> transportation is mandated. We have a $5.8 million transportation budget as mm -hmm. one of the two largest geographical towns in the state, and we get nothing get for transportation. So the uh, short answer is, I don't know. I, I'm not going to tell you. We need to figure out how do we account for that as we go. Don't have an answer for you. In, in, in just FYI, other states deal with it differently. In Massachusetts, if you want public transportation and you have the means uh, to afford it, they'll, they'll charge you a fee in, in bus. So in Pawtucket, they don't get charged the fee, but in Attleboro, if you want to send your, your student to a public school, you can get a bill at the start of the year. So, uh, let me, let me. No, bus transportation. I'm talking about school bus transportation. Let me, uh, I got, yeah. I think I have, a, a, right. I got yeah, a few more slides. When I say public transportation, I'm alluding to your bus tr contracts. Right. You're providing the service. What, from a Senate proposal perspective, I think if we add all the numbers up, it's higher than what the governor has proposed early on. Can I tell you how it affects each, every city and town? Not yet. I have a thought. That's still being worked. We want it to be more than that. It's critical to invest in education, and I'll say it again. As Providence goes, so goes the entire state. Absolutely. Categorically. Not just from an education perspective, but everything else that comes after that. And we, the state... We're responsible for it. No. Okay, let's talk about a couple of phenomenal bills. You'll, you'll know why they're phenomenal, but I'm not going to tell you. You can figure that out. There's two of them. The first one affects more than just a set of cities and towns, but the, piece, the first one is Senate Bill 454 and House Bill 5792. I got the right numbers. I can tell you who the key sponsors are on those if you want. Not important. But it increases the minimum housing aid from, by the way, that ended the funding formula. With regards to that, we have work to do. We're committed to do something with it. The governor's proposed a fair amount of money on education funding. I believe the Senate and the House will as well. Keep your voices coming. Don't, don't stop. If there's one thing I learned in uh, my private life of working, I'm on a couple boards, uh, and clearly at the State House in, in public office. Don't take no for an answer when yes is the only right answer. Don't. Keep speaking, speak respectfully, here's our facts, here's our data, and have somebody sit down with you, like the chair here said, and say, here's our property values, here's the number of students we got, and our number's less. How do we get there from here? Then the question's get asked, what did the, the municipality give you? Well, they gave us less. 
Okay, we got to figure it out. That's part, that's part of the context story. So it, it increases the minimum housing aid from 35 to 40, 35% to 45%. Okay? 18 cities and towns in the state of Rhode Island are stuck at 35%. Almost the entire East Bay. And oh, by the way, who's here from Warwick? Warwick is at 35% too. So if, you go, if you're going to build, build something new, and you're going to go get the, category, the bonuses, I was almost going to say cooler and warmer, but newer and fewer, right? Warmer and drier, steam, et cetera, et cetera. And you can, let's assume you get up to 20%, four of the five, four, five percent bonuses. That would be 55%, right? Nah, can't do it. The law says it can't be more than 50% of your core foundational aid. That's just wrong. It's just, it's just wrong. Why, why, why I missed it when we first passed it, I did. We missed that. So we're seeking to raise the 35 to 40 percent. 18 cities and towns in the state of Rhode Island would benefit from that. So a lot of the districts in here have taken advantage of the $250 million housing bonds that were passed. My understanding is that's only construction that's starting new. Is there any way you can have that fit to the, the bonds that we've passed? Because we're seeing humongous cost increases from when that started. And I think for all of us, that would make a huge difference. So good, good. at least including those, those bonds. We'll check and see. I know Newport's seeing it in spades. Yeah. Yes. In Providence, there's actually a decrease to the group home aid of over 40%. So that's a great concern for me. Mm -hmm. I had a nephew that was uh, disabled living yep. in a group home that just passed away six months ago. So. Uh, I'd like to know more why it's increasing uh, across the state, but decreasing for the group home aid projections for Providence, so the, please. Uh, sorry to hear about your, you said nephew? Tony Aiken from Providence, yes. The uh, group homes are driven by numbers, numbers, numbers of individuals in group homes. That's what drives it. So I know like in Middletown, I've got how many group homes we had, and as the number of beds, I'm being respectfully direct, as the number of beds went up and down, so too did the cost. It's all driven by... If, how, many, how many students there are in that particular city and town. So the, other, but so the other piece in here, I think we're okay, is the, I'm glad I didn't wait till questions till the end, huh? Uh, extends the date for the start of construction from June 30th, 2023 to June 30th, excuse me, December 30th to June extends it six months. Because right now you have to start construction by the end of the year. That's those two bills. Yes? I just want to ask the question to hear your answer on it is, just to what was said from Portsmouth, for those of us who are already in projects mm -hmm. and have seen and are committed to and cannot go back, what can you just tell us what you're doing on that, please? We've discussed it. Those, these bills are a go forward. It's not about projects that have already started. So there's nothing being considered at this time for those of us in there. There's no specific bill that I'm, well, I can't say there's no specific bill. In finance, Thursday night there were 202 bills. Friday morning there was 203 or 203 or, or two, uh, Thursday 203. On Friday there was 204 bills in finance. There's many less in education. I don't know all the bills that are in there. I'll go and check to see. The next piece, school construction enhancements, sort of ties to that. A couple things, and this is these are just the highlights. But for this piece up here, pretty much, you'll see this number change several times because it goes to each of the bonuses. Warmer, drier, newer, and fewer, et cetera. This one down here is a couple more things in it, but it would make interest payments eligible for reimbursements the year the bond is issued. Right now, the state still pays it, but it's not until the project is done. The next piece talks about ensuring apprentice program utilization, and then for projects over $10 million, have a study done regarding the use of project labor agreements in achieving the state purchasing goals. Some general language there. Uh, that's what at a macro level. But there's also a piece in here that I did not include because it wasn't a room on the page and I wasn't going to create another page for this necessarily that talked to uh, high performance schools, energy efficiency. Uh, I think these bills are getting some traction. Yes. It discusses that these are for the bonds that were approved from November 2018 only. So the school construction enhancements, are we talking the same yes. language in there? So anything that was approved from two, in November of 2022 at the polls, or anything going forward is, is irrelevant. The wording says for 2018. I believe it's, I was going to say, 
Yes, I have to go back and check the language for this. I, I want to just verify it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Two bills, which I'm sure some folks here are not happy about. Maybe you are. Uh, the first one, and I didn't give any details here, about, but I'll talk about one is the IEP process enhancement, and then the one, second one is about special ed ombudsman. So those are the numbers uh, that are here for the Senate bill and the House bill. Both, I'm thinking, both of these, the ombudsman definitely we've heard a couple years now. The IEP one is new this year. There's work underway to get amendments to it based on the testimony that was heard. Uh, there's an issue, and if anybody believes there isn't, I'd love to have a conversation with you about, anybody here from Bristol Warren? Okay. There's a, uh, from an IEP perspective, special ed perspective, it's a big cost driver for you, right? Categorically is. Uh, what we heard in spades last year, this year, in relationship to the ombudsman, in relation to the IEP process, and the IEP process at its macro level creates more involvement and uh, I'll say co-authorization with a parent about the initial IEP being created plan and any change to the plan. Uh, families are going through some severe challenges, severe challenges, and some at significant expense to address the special education for their children. It, they just are. We, I can give you the testimony if you want. Uh, we have it all. I can send it to you. You can, you can talk to the folks. And these are the folks that came to talk to us. Some folks with some means, both monetarily, because it costs to bring somebody in to help as an advocate. Uh, and there's a great one in Portsmouth. I've talked to her several times. She's given us some, she's not on the school committee, she's given us several suggestions about how we can make it better, because she sees it across the state in spades. Uh, and then others, not from a monetary perspective, but what's your first name? Robert has the wherewithal, I'm going to go in, everybody wants to stand up for the child, everybody does. Robert's taking the next step, I'm not leaving this room until we figure this out. You're going to have to rest all, maybe it won't go that far. Uh, we got to, my child is being impacted by this. The concern is, that's probably 2%, 5%, some percent, very low percentage of those in the state. Imagine not knowing the language, imagine knowing the language is like, no, they, they must know. They're the experts. They're going to tell me. I don't have any personal experience here, but I know it from, uh, well, from people who I have. Uh, walking into a room, not really having the wherewithal to advocate for your child, for whatever reason, I'm, I'm not saying it's bad, not knowing the language very well, and there's 14 people in the room, and you and your significant other are just you. That group's going to spend the money to do whatever they need to do to spend the money to make, say, why they're doing is the right thing. I, I know I'm generalizing it. I know it's a big cost for you. The current process is broken. We need, we're trying to look at some things that Massachusetts has done. There's some changes. Some of the dates and times and durations uh, need to be changed based on some of the experts that came and talked to us. But the, uh, looking at the IEP process, I encourage you folks to take a look at it. Send some suggestions, if you have, to the chair. You can send them to Tim. Tim, clearly the collector of them. Uh, it's probably the better place. Don't send them to the, you can, well, send them to the chair. But Tim could be a good collector of, hey, I got these about uh, this bill. It has some legs. I support it, and I'm working to try and help the, the sponsor get it over the goal line. The next one, the ombudsman. This one here is, think of this person akin to anybody familiar with the child advocate within the Department of Children, not in the Department of Children, separate. We have a child advocate. Phenomenal, organ, phenomenal organization. Uh, eight or nine people that address tens of thousands of children, babies, children, adolescents, teenagers, whatever, in the receiving child welfare services from the state of Rhode Island. They do a phenomenal job. They ensure that the child and adolescent that needs the services is getting your services at the right time in the right place for the right reason, they work to ensure that happens. Can you think of that as an ombudsman? To some degree. We don't have one of those. Other places do. We do have a, a mental health ombudsman and some others. Uh, a senior ombudsman, I believe we have. 
We do. Uh, this is somebody who's going to help facilitate uh, when the state's not or the city or town's not doing whatever or that particular family thinks that's not, can intervene and help to figure out what's the right process here. Our special ed process is broken. It is. It, given, like I said, from the folks I've talked to, I've called folks after that, had meetings with folks after that, based on what you hear, and it happens. So uh, anybody here from Cranston? Somebody was here from Cranston, right? <laughs> I think Cranston has a, from what we heard, and Senator Gallo brought it up and thought, pretty good uh, process for special ed. Some other cities and towns? Nope. Some cases have gone to, and some said, well, isn't that a ride responsibility? It absolutely is. Folks go to ride. Ride does it. Ride tells the city and town, or the local school district what needs to be done. The local school district says, thank you. Nope, we're not doing it. Ride does it again. They don't do it. What happens, what happens after that? What's the next step? Next. Where? It's not a civil rights bill. Where does it go? Because it's federal court. Federal court. I don't think anybody wants a federal judge ruling on a case. Ones I've seen, city and town then said, here's the check. It's not about the money. What's your name again? I forgot. Robert. Robert. Robert's child didn't get the education they needed for two or three years. Is that right? Nobody's child it is. But the city and town later on says, hang on, how much is that judge? And they wrote the check. Oh, sorry. And, and, and they wrote the check. They wrote the check for that. I don't know the specifics of it. I know some of the details of it because I've, I've seen it. It's public because uh, it went to the court. Uh, I've read what went back and forth. I know third hand or second hand what's happening, so I'm not going to cast the spurs one way or another. So when somebody says, why is it needed? That's an instance of why it's needed. And this is an individual with means, an individual that knows the law, and that's what they experienced and all that. Yes, sir. The interest payments being eligible for reimbursement, mm -hmm. the other bond is issued. Um, I'm from Woe. We, we have a big interest in that because we're trying to build two high schools. So, and, and, our, and our estimates were done in early 2022. So, Bless you. you know, the, the COVID, that's baked in already. But the issue is when you start the project, you tend to do short term financing right away, yep. you know, for the first couple of years. And, you know, Three years ago, that could have been a half a percent, one percent. Now that could be three or four. So it's crippling to a municipal budget. So if the reimbursement can come as you go, then the layout for, for from the from the municipality is much more manageable from a budget perspective because that would kill any significant project for almost Correct. virtually any city and town. It's that short-term borrowing cost. So right. that that's very very uh, important. It's as important to us as the start and end dates. Um, and as far as green energy. Um, I know early on in our process, I had reached out to our local delegation about one of our high schools about looking into um, a geothermal heating system there because the land was, appeared to be good for it and all that. I just didn't know if there were any federal, federal money, state monies that would help because that's an expensive proposition right. at the beginning and, and it's too much for the school department or municipality right. to take on. Um, so, I mean, that would be something, if you want to get a zero emission building, school building in your school, which uses a lot of energy, right. uh, that, that's a... That's a perfect use of, of federal funds. So let me start from the back and go forward. I think the, you bring up some great points. Uh, I'm not just going to end it there. I think having a, I, I could follow up. We have a conversation with the folks from, with Chris Kearns, who's the director of the Office of Energy Regula Regulation, that interacts with the feds and the state from an energy policy perspective about what might be available there. Uh, and you have a, a very uh, receptive voice uh, you're going to talk, you can talk to in Warwick, so we'll, we'll leave that there. So he, he's your, you're his constituent, right? So uh, we're talking about the speaker, right? So let's, uh, anybody from North Providence? Or, uh, we have Providence. Anybody in Senator Ruggiero's district? Okay. Well, you're going to be the advocate for Providence, for Senator Ruggiero, because he has part of Providence. But I'm saying with regards to moving things forward, uh, Warwick is in that 35 to 40 percent and it would be beneficial, and the reimbursement for, because they're going to pay it anyway. It just pays it earlier, right? Uh, you, I, brought up, I, thought I had a thought about something when you just said that. One other thing. Uh, so my wife's a retired kindergarten teacher 
for a middle school teacher, retired seven years ago when our first grandchild was born, who turned seven the other day. Uh, her whole family were all teachers, all retired teachers or principals. I, ha I had her mom as a teacher in high school, so I knew my mother-in-law before I knew my wife. Uh, and, but it, my brother-in-law was a house master at Fairfield Ward High School in Fairfield. Uh, he retired four or five years ago. From an energy perspective, which I think is ingenious, I haven't seen it here yet, in their parking lot, they built a solar cover port, solar air carport. Parking lot for all the students, guess what? They're the, ener the energy that's generated from that feeds right to the building. We're not cutting any trees. Maybe where it's located, uh, people may not like to see the solar panels. And, and Senator, we, we looked at that at our administrative yep. administration building. Uh, there was a program that National Grid had rolled out. So when we were at, we signed the letter of intent, yep. but then I, my understanding is that the the rules of the program changed and it just wasn't advantageous for us anymore. Okay. But we definitely looked into that. It seems like one of those things where we're trying to generate that, that maybe somebody else wants to put it in. You get money for it because it's a rent kind of thing. But, so let's, uh, let's end here. Uh, I do want to thank you. You folks have a big job. And I'm not just saying it because I'm here and I want to leave. I want to eat the rest of my bagel and get out of here. No, you have a big job. It is appreciated. We know how much work you go through. We know how much work you go through. And, having to advocate to your brethren sitting next to you on the council who might be relative or you see somewhere, <coughs> and they say no. Well, it's a big deal because at the end of the day, <coughs> there's a <coughs> hundreds of thousands, hundred plus thousand students, 140, whatever the number is these days, in Rhode Island, they're counting on all of you uh, to get it right. By the way, there was one point I don't think I mentioned. I'm just thinking going back to it now. Oh, public school of choice. That's referred to what? Charter schools. The, uh, we had a, uh, going back to Providence for a second, the mayor came in and said, we asked him. In fact, Senator Pearson asked him, uh, later Pearson at the committee, and the commissioner, looking to expand the charters, whatever. You have the money, that's going to be, it seems like it's going to be a negative impact to you in Providence with those students going to the charter schools. You, you, you get, how do you have that addressed uh, from a budget perspective? Well, we've got it covered, categorically. Want to go watch the tape? We can get the tape to go watch. So the Senate proposal does not have that in there with regards to covering the cost of that there. It wasn't, they basically said we can cover it. Okay. So I just want to make sure, I knew there was one piece. Uh, I mean, I try to say, well, if I put something on a slide, it's intentional. Sometimes it's unintentional because I might have fallen asleep and put, wrote something down and didn't go back and change it. But I want to try and get the high points across. Uh, it is the end. You can smile now. You can go, maybe you're going to have a break. But thank you. Uh, I'm hoping I did justice to what Leader Pearson would have had. He knows this extremely well. I think I know it reasonably well, having looked at it, having experienced it like he did. He was on, uh, in council on school committee in uh, Cumberland town council, but we have an appreciation for, I like to say, as legislators, when we're evaluating bills, evaluating legislation, I look at it from, except for one time in my 15 years, I think, I try and look at the bills on how they have, through the lens of how it impacts the four cities and towns that I represent. Sorry, Portsmouth, you're in the middle. I don't, I don't, I don't care. No. But no, we look at, well, but, how, but how it how it affects the cities and towns when we make this decision. Know that we try and do that. If we don't, that's why you're there to say, hey, wait a minute, did you consider this? No. Councilor Winslow, thanks for bringing it up. So I hope it was informative, hope you got some ideas. It changes on some of the bills, let us know. But just know, we are fixated, not just focused. We're fixated on ensuring education gets funded, gets funded right, and we make things long-term, long-lasting impacts in the right direction. We may not be able to get all the funding we need initially there, but I, I have not seen a legislator yet that says, oh, no, we're, yeah, we're funding education just fine. We are spending a lot of money, right? We are spending a lot of money. We need to make sure we spend it in the right place and the formula gets it to the right place. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank, thank you, Senator. <laughs> thank you, Senator, uh, for taking the time on a Saturday to come out and 